Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our public conversation, our last one of um, 2021. I almost said 2019 for a second, and then I'm like, no, that's not even it. 2020 definitely isn't it, and we're not quite at 2022, but we're here. Um, and thank you for joining us. I know Eventbrite is down right now, so I really appreciate those of y'all who maybe just received an email from me and joined us. We're also live on Facebook, so welcome everybody. My name is Cassandra Lawrence, and I am the Communications and Community Engagement Manager here with Shoulder to Shoulder Campaign, and I want to welcome you to our um, public conversation. These conversations we've been holding for about a year now, uh, we started um, to feature leaders who are doing good work in different capacities, utilizing different strategies and approaches to transform society. If you don't know who Shoulder to Shoulder is, if this is your first time, Shoulder to Shoulder is a multi is a national multi faith coalition based campaign of 34 religious denominations around 60 faith based inter and interfaith community organizations and thousands of individual people who are committed to addressing anti Muslim discrimination in the United States. We advance our vision by directly engaging faith leaders and communities in the United States to be strategic partners in countering and dis countering discrimination and violence against, against Muslims by connecting, equipping, and mobilizing faith communities. Our guests this month are the team at the Sister Act podcast who come together to discuss, discuss life, faith, and resilience, they broadcast this podcast regularly on their Facebook channel. On that channel, I saw that they've discussed their faith and cultural identities and public topics, including kidney transplants, how the pandemic has been has impacted families and religious life, religious freedom, racism, divorce, domestic violence, voting rights, and so much more. I personally know both uh, Dr. Sabrina Dent and her Anessa Fariad from our overlapping interfaith and justice work here in the DC, Washington, DC area. And I'm so glad to finally meet Rabbi Shankman. I'm just gonna share a few words about each of our guests and then we'll get this conversation started. Uh, her Anessa, who's gonna wave. Uh, she is, um, she lives in Sterling, Virginia with her four daughters and serves as head of outreach, PR and interfaith at the All Dulles Area Muslim Society, also known here as the Adams Center. It's the second largest mosque in the United States. She is an active member of the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council and Peace Catalyst International, as well as a member of the board of directors at the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy. Rabbi Susan Shankman has been a rabbi at Washington Hebrew Congregation for over 20 years. In addition to officiating services, life cycle events, pastoral care and counseling, and outreach to interfaith families, social justice work, she also does ongoing dialogue with the interfaith community. She was the first female president of the Washington Board of Rabbis, and she has also served on the board of the Central Conference of American Rabbis. Dr. Sabrina Dent is a lifelong advocate for human rights and social justice. She developed a strong passion for humanity as a religious freedom advocate in 2015, when she became a BJC fellow with the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. Her doctoral dissertation, which is amazing by the way, project title was Bridging the Gap of Race and Interfaith Relations, Connecting hum Humanity with Our Stories. She's the editor and contributing author of the book, African Americans and Religious Freedom, New Perspectives for Congregations and Communities. And she was recently named the Center for American Progress, one of 21 faith leaders to watch in 2021. We are also joined today by our whole staff at Shoulder to Shoulder, uh, and you can check out our bios on our webpage. Uh, we have uh, myself, Cassandra, uh, Nina Fernando, who is our executive director, and Ozma Saber, um, our outreach and development uh, specialist. So now that we got through some introductions, I just want to like open up the conversation. So the, one of the reasons I was interested in having this public conversation with uh, you all from Sister Act 
was because we wanted to hear more about what inspired you three to start this podcast and then what it's been, what inspires you to keep it going. And then when we realized that our staff just so happened to also be all women, we thought, let's have a great big conversation with all six of us. Um, and so I would love to get started first by hearing from uh, you all um, about this podcast and how you all get, got started. What was your inspiration? Um, okay, so all of our work is centered around multi-faith and interfaith work that we're doing. And when I started in this field almost five years ago, I realized there was a void of spaces where women were present, where women were at the table, where women were part of the conversation. Everywhere I went, it was always male dominated. And only a few times would I see a panel of six people on stage and maybe there would be one female on stage. And I had a problem with that because women are part of society. We are mobilized in so many different ways. We connect so many different aspects of life that to not have us at the table was so odd. And so I try to figure out what would be the best way to get at least content out. And so I decided to start a podcast <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to have a female rabbi and a uh, female uh, Christian as well. And what ended up happening is I reached out to Rabbi Susan first and I said, hey, I'm thinking about starting this podcast. Would you be interested? And she said, yes, because we've been friends for a really long time. And I said, okay, great. I have my rabbi. Now I need a, a, a female Christian. And I ran into, you know, I, I knew Dr. Sabrina as well. And, you know, she's an amazing Christian scholar. I mean, look, she has a title doctor in front of her name. I'm going to put her on the spot. And, and, and I have to vouch for that, right? Because we have to build each other up. And I was like, oh, I'm going to have like a doctor on my podcast. I'm going to have a rabbi on the podcast. And I'm going to title myself Reverend because I was called that once. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> You know, we can all have a conversation centered around how faith affects our lives because no one hears our stories. And why is it that we all have to be the same faith on a podcast? No, we can be a different faith. You can be a spiritual person like Dr. Sabrina is, and she's a, a Christian scholar. And then you can be a rabbi like Sue is, and you can bring that perspective into the conversation as well. So how do we go around doing this? And that's how Sister Act started because you know, we're, we're sisters at the end of the day. We love each other in that bond, bonding element of us being women. And regardless of our faith and regardless of what's going on in our lives, we can bring this aspect of our humanness into the conversation. And so I think that's what makes us unique in that we talk about topics that are relevant to us, but also we have fun. And, and I'm all about having fun um, and, and cracking jokes left and right, even though we're talking about serious conversations, because again, that's still part of life. Um, but I'll let the other ladies um, jump in and hear what they have to say as well. So I will, I will share. I I was so excited when her and Nessa first floated this, and this was pre-COVID, and actually she did it very wisely over baklava and Turkish coffee. <laughs> so I was sold. <laughs> but um, but the reality is that we've we've been together, spent time together at lots of, of big community events, and having this opportunity to really get into the nitty gritty, really take a deep dive into our um, into. Uh, what we share, what what is different, to be able to um, talk about life through our uh, our shared lens as women, uh, as mothers, um, but also as women of faith, and even um, and and embracing the fact that not just acknowledging the differences, but embracing those, and um, and sh learning from those. I think one of the things that I found over over decades of interfaith work and certainly study in, in both uh, undergraduate and graduate school um, is that spending time and learning from and with uh, others of faith and, and especially of different faiths actually enhances my own uh, beliefs and understanding and, and how I approach uh, my own faith. Um, and, and I think it also allows us to be, to be better together, not to sound um, corny, but really this, this idea that when we, when we share and when we are not afraid to have the tough conversations that we have this opportunity to, to raise each other up, um, both as women and as human beings. 
And so, you know, we started this conversation before COVID and then COVID hit. And, um, and we were trying to figure out, especially in the, the first few months um, and before Dr. Sabrina joined us to uh, think about like, what do people want to hear? What are people struggling with? What do they want to know? How are they looking at the world? What are the big issues? And, um, and it was really important. Uh, we, we have had a couple of men on the podcast, but it was really important for us to lift up women's voices uh, and, um, and speak to the, the diversity of experiences so that you know, whatever any one of us is, is feeling and experiencing, there are others out there experiencing and feeling the same things. And sometimes not the people next to you. So how do we help people connect with one another and, uh, and feel like even, and especially during COVID, that we're not alone out there, that there are these, um, these communities that reach out and embrace us. Yes, I agree with what my sisters have already said. Uh, I would say when I received the, um, the email, the invitation from her and Nessa, I, um, I was pleasantly surprised. It was a welcome invitation because of the work that I've done that focused on um, interfaith and building community and understanding other people's perspectives. It was important for me to even practice that even more by having this opportunity to um, learn more about my sisters and their, their beliefs and how they engage life and uh, how they approach, uh, how they use their faith to approach addressing many issues. And so what um, has been a joy for me and being part of this podcast is one, I celebrate the fact that her and Nessa thought about creating space for women. Like it's so important that women have spaces where they can authentically be themselves and share in, um, especially Especially when historically uh, many of our religious traditions have put women in the background. And so we have to remember that um, for many, many years and also centuries, women ran uh, civilizations, right? Not just being actively a part of faith communities, but civilizations. And so to have this space where we can talk about the issues that impact us and then also find a lot of commonalities in our experiences. So if you've ever watched like the podcast, you'll see us talking about our middle school age children, right? I have a, I have a son. And so um, to talk about about the experiences and have that connection to as, as mothers, as women that are working and doing work and trying to help society be better in the ways in which we believe we've been called to show up um, makes this much more a much more enriching, um, enriching experience. And so I've been grateful for the opportunity to learn more about Rabbi Sue and her Anessa on this journey. And also for us to really see how we have been resilient in the experiences that we've navigated in life. And that's one of the things I appreciate about the podcast is that we don't hold back in sharing those things. Like we speak truth because um, it, there have been times in many, in many of our faith communities where we haven't been able to speak authentically about our experiences. And so that inspires and encourages other women and men, right? To, um, to think differently and to really explore what is healthy for them, even as it pertains to religion. I think that is so important that people critically think through that. And so I have um, a lot of gratitude for being among these incredible ladies in doing this work. So um, the podcast has meant a lot to me and even the topics that we explore that uh, people don't think about that pertains to our faith or how we, um, how we believe or even those that don't believe. And I think that's important to know. I feel like the um, uh, when listening to you all and just now hearing you all share, I think the thing that's surprised me about doing interfaith stuff is just how much you learn about yourself and your own culture and family tradition while being in conversation and relationship with other people. Um, I feel like I, I didn't go to seminary until I started doing interfaith stuff. And I was like, oh, maybe I should learn how to be more, a better Christian. <laughs> um, I felt like I was doing okay, but then like going and meeting uh, Muslim siblings and Jewish siblings and Buddhists and even atheists and all different kinds of folks just helped me better understand that I needed to be more aware of what I was doing um, or what my faith tradition was. Uh, and so I would love to ask like, has there been um, 
anything that has surprised you in this podcast work of like something that you didn't realize about yourself or about your community um, that you've learned about yourself in this work? I will share that initially. And, and even when her and Esther first asked me, I, I was thinking, you know, yes, I, I give sermons. Yes, I'm in front of people in my community and also in other parts of the community. But um, do I have anything really worthwhile to say on a podcast on a weekly or biweekly uh, basis? And, um, and then the idea as somebody who uh, I'm probably one of the few I don't know, I'm guessing. I'm, I, I know a lot of rabbis out there, at least people I know, and, and probably the same is true of other uh, faith leaders, um, did a lot of acting or, or uh, were involved in drama growing up. <laughs> I was not, I was, I was in the stage crew. <laughs> uh, so also thinking about even, you know, one of the things that through COVID that, that we've all needed to get comfortable with, if it, especially if it was outside our comfort zone, is being on camera. <laughs> and the idea of, of having those conversations. But um, I think one of the things that I've uh, not only embraced, but really has made this all, it, it feel, it, it is real. It's not just that it feels real. It's not that we're, yes, we're virtual in the sense of technically we're on screen, um, but it's about the relationship. And that, um, that goes beyond any, uh, anything superficial. It actually goes so much deeper. And, um, and being able to, to realize and recognize the ways in which having a conversation um, can just simply having a conversation can can deepen and strengthen those relationships and and I for me and I'm not sure if I expect I you know my initial thought was also how can I ever do this how can I sustain this weekly um, which COVID helped us <laughs> at least initially because there wasn't a whole lot else going I mean there were other things going on but clearly I, you know I wasn't leaving my house. Um, but it was so grounding. And, uh, and to have this as something that was an anchor for me through that time, um, and something that, uh, that it's, it's not something that's a passing phase or something I'm doing in this moment for this year during COVID, but something that I'm really committed to and committed to as a priority because the conversation goes beyond a weekly podcast or a biweekly podcast to the work we do together in person as we move out of this um, and the work that we, you know, I, the, the commitment, it's, it's strengthened my commitment, which is not that surprising. It was already there, but strengthen my commitment to the work that we're doing in, in the interfaith community as we come out of this, knowing that there is so much work as we've all seen and are aware of, there's so much work that we, um, we can do and so much that we can, uh, can, can help to repair in, in our world. And we need to do it together. Absolutely. I agree, Rabbi Sue. Um, one of the things that I learned about myself is really my commitment to inter interfaith and multi-faith work um, because of the conversations that we have, right? It, it's beyond just being in a space where we're talking about our religious differences, but also uh, for me, my commitment to interfaith work, multi-faith work that intersects with the social needs and concerns of other people. And so it allows me to think more deeply about how I want to show up in the world and um, the work that I want to continue to do. At the same time, I will honestly admit one of the it also forced me to do was to learn a little bit more about my own history and my own family. And what I mean by that is I remember from the very first episode that, <laughs> that I was invited to be a part of, we were talking about our journeys to America. And I, and I, I told her, that's what Rabbi Sue was like, uh, my family's journey was a little different. So it was like this going down this road of really bringing my full self and my history and my family into this conversation and really explore more of what that meant, looking at the legacy of my family, because um, I do come from a line of um, clergy leaders and preachers um, and uh, religious influencers. And so I I, it, it just uh, deepened my awareness of self and the and really the pride that I have for my family history and our and our 
um, survival here in the United States. And so to tell that story alongside my sisters who had different narratives, right, just goes back to the work that we did um, at the Religious Freedom Center when we talked about engaging in dialogue and de developing a deeper understanding for someone else's experiences while you share your own. And so that has been a major takeaway for me being a part of this. And so it then translates even more into how I do advocacy work. And so it has been a very meaningful experience. And so it's really every time we have a new conversation, I walk away from it thinking about what is my responsibility to take more action because I'm doing this along my sisters um, because at that identify differently from me, but have so many commonalities um, in terms of the way in which we engage society and the work that we're doing to support the communities that we love and say we love. That was beautiful, Dr. Sabrina and Rabbi um, Sue. And to add on to what they just explained, for me, I realized how my vulnerability on the podcast was able to resonate with so many women. I wasn't even expecting that. My initial reason for it was to have a, a platform where women's voices of faith uh, was able to give content out to people who wanted to listen. It, it's not about how many listeners we have or you know how many likes we have on Facebook. That wasn't the intention at all. It was simply about having content out so that if anyone had any question, they would go and research it and find it. But our podcast brought out this idea and this aspect of my life that I'm very vulnerable on my podcast. I'm very vulnerable in, in general since I've started this podcast and I'm very open about my life. And that has been able to resonate with so many women who have, after watching an episode or listening to one, uh, have called me or emailed me or messaged me, even like women from Japan e emailing me or like from overseas. And I was like, what people in Japan listen to us? <laughs> like that was <laughs> a, a nice thing to see, but it was just so different. Right? I wasn't expecting that. But I think when women message me and tell me that, oh, I listened to your podcast and what you three had to say resonated with me because I'm a single mom myself and I'm going through a really horrible divorce and you gave me the energy and the conviction to go and fight for myself. And, I, she, and she was explicit in saying that I did not have that confidence before I listened to your podcast. And for me, that was huge. Even if we can make a different in one difference in one person's life, I feel like we've done a lot because there's so many people out there that are going through so many difficulties who are silent, whose voices are never being heard. And if we can at least talk about our issues and it could resonate with someone, maybe it'll help them go get help. Maybe it'll help them speak to someone. Maybe it'll help them come out of something that they're really struggling with. And as women, we know that a bulk of life issues with our families are on our shoulders. Right. And how, how do we express that? How do we come together to talk about those things? So knowing that my vulnerability was able to catalyze some form of conversation with other people, I felt so honored by that. And I felt that we need to keep this going. We need to you know, have this conversation. We need to be there for one another. And it's women from all different backgrounds. And I think that is one of the biggest takeaway from this podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm 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 just amazed to have friends like y'all. <laughs> like I was in it's funny it's like the connection between that is that I was at Washington Hebrew in September uh, for the our local unity walk that happens. We have an interfaith walk that goes along Pennsylvania Avenue where there is an incredible diversity of religious communities, religious and ethical communities. And uh, Washington Hebrew is the beginning point of that uh, uh, walk. And I was inside the building going to use the facilities. And there was Hernessa picking up like goods from Washington Hebrew for, um, I think, the multi-faith networks collection for the Afghan refugees. Isn't that correct, Hari? Yeah. So I also work as director of outreach for multi-faith neighbors network. And um, our national project was to collect toiletries for the Afghan refugees settling in different cities all across the US. And because I work for multi-faith and I'm here and I'm also Afghan myself, I came here as a child refugee uh, when the Soviets first invaded. 
it, it was something that was very personal to me. And I wanted to make sure that I was part of whatever was going on. And I was walking through the hall and there come, comes Cassandra. And I'm like, wow, I don't remember you being so tall. Uh, maybe because I'm short, but I was like, oh, she's really tall. <laughs> she's so nice. Like, <laughs> like Cassandra. You know, and it was really nice to, for her and I to meet at Sue's synagogue, right? Like it's home. Like I go there and they're like, oh, it's in this room. I'm like, yeah, I know which room it's like because I've been here so many times. Um, but it was so nice to see friends in, in familiar spaces. But if we're not allowing ourselves to open up to that, we will never be, get to that space. Or they would never get to the place where, you know, you guys can come to our mosque and be like, oh yeah, I know where the restroom is. I know where Hernessa's office is or I know where the imam's office is. We have to be open to that. And I love the fact that I got to run into you that day. It's, it's, a, it's a habit of, of our like work. We go out in the town and we just run into people all the time. I'd love to pop in and ask a question to you all. And, and again, so grateful for you, for you joining and for what you do and thankful to Cassandra from our team for bringing this idea to bring you on and be in conversation with you. So, you know, at our work at Shoulder to Shoulder, as, as you know, you know, it's, it's very mission centered around addressing this problem uh, preventing and countering anti-Muslim discrimination here in the United States. And, and really not just what we're against, but also what are we for? What are we building? Uh, building a society where all people are treated with dignity and respect and fairness, um, living, having this nation live up to its ideals. Uh, and, and, and so as it relates to, to you all, you know, each of you come from different backgrounds and, and from communities that have been marginalized and discriminated against here in the United States in different capacities. And, and, and the question I have is, is what is it meant for you to team up and how have you supported each other in the face of discrimination and hate that you've experienced on as yourselves or or as your communities have experienced here in the United States and also what is the role for for people who don't come from your communities so uh you know what about um other communities that have faced discrimination and hate so it's really a, a really big question um but but what what lessons do you have um for us what best practices um what little tips bits have you learned uh, in your relationship with one another? So I'll, I'll jump in here first. Um, one of the things that I would say is my experience previously um, in the work that I did with the Interfaith Council of Greater Richmond kind of set me up very nicely to continue this work and to work alongside um, her Anessa and Rabbi Sue. And I say that um, by saying and thinking about my own personal experiences of why I even entered interfaith work. Um, I was a student at uh, the Samuel D. Wood Proctor School of Theology and made it very clear in a conversation with uh, Dr. John W. Kenny, who was the dean at the time, that I knew that the work of ministry for me looked a lot different for what a lot of people in the seminary were, were preparing for, which then led to me uh, going to ICGR to uh, become engaged in interfaith work. And it was the experiences that I had there um, with people of many different religious identities um, at the time when Islamophobia was um, and xenophobia were running rampant at, um, in this country a couple of years ago. And unfortunately, we still see that today. But there was this solidarity movement to stand with those who had been marginalized. And so my experience um, was like, you, you do that. You show up. I, I strongly believe that communities that are marginalized should stand together and advocate for one another. And those that say that their allies need to do the same. And so in, in my work with ICGR, there were numerous times where I did that and I continued to do it even when I moved to this location. So fast forward, um, uh, my doctoral research as uh, Cassandra mentioned was focused on bridging the gap between race and interfaith relations. And so I strongly believe and stated in my thesis that communities that say that they're inclusive but exclude anyone then are hypocrites of the missions that they proclaim to um, they proclaim to support. And that goes for any organization that says they are inclusive and they, they have, they're concerned about everyone, but then exclude any person's identity as part of that conversation. And so um, some of my experience was I felt that exclusion. So then coming into this 
this opportunity to be um, to work alongside her Nessa and Rabbi Sue when opportunities presented itself for me to like take action on some issues. So, for example, I know when uh, when um, her and Nessa started sharing information about the Afghan refugees, I probably got on her nerves because I kept texting her asking like, what can I do? Where can I show up? How can I support? And I think that is important to know um, that we're not just doing this on a podcast and then done, right? It's like, we, we're committed to having these conversations and doing this work, even uh, to connect it to um, shoulder, to, shoulder to shoulder a little bit. My relationship with Cassandra started um, years ago through the Interfaith, um, the Interfaith Summit that was hosted by the Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan uh, Washington. And so, with that, we build upon that relationship. And there were times that we had, uh, Cassandra has been to my home for a, for a, it was a living room conversation that we had to talk about Jefferson. And so for me, it's really meaningful that if I'm doing interfaith work, that I'm doing it from a place remembering the people that I say I love, the people that I say I respect, the people that I say are my friends. That And so that means that I have a responsibility, this is Sabrina speaking, I have a responsibility to show up for those people when there are issues and concerns that that community has. And so for me, it is my experiences from the past, my lived experiences that bring me into uh, this space of wanting to do it and, 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 and engage more deeply in this work. So for me, it's not superficial. It comes from a place of um, even integrity. I can't write a thesis like that and then not do the work, right? So it's important that I do this work. And so that's why I celebrate who we are as women and how we show up for communities. And so Rabbi Sue and I have never had the pleasure of meeting in person. But one of the things I do want to highlight, because it's not just about interfaith work, but again, how we show up for one another in doing this work is um, Rabbi Sue invited us to her daughter's bar mitzvah. And, um, and it, was, it was a meaningful experience for me um, to be a part of such a sacred ceremony, but also to have my son present during that time to witness like this celebration and so I, I think moments like that even are things that we need to take into account when we're talking about doing multi-faith work. It's not just what is done publicly, right? It's also those private and, and intimate engagements that bring us closer to one another. And so that is something that has helped me even more. And, and again, it shows up in my advocacy work where I'll sign on to a letter in support of a community that might be suffering or marginalized. And by the way, not to hijack uh, this moment in our conversation today, but um, we are actually meeting in person for the first time next week, which we're so excited. Sister Act next week, everybody tune in. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think I think so much of it is also, um, it's it's about, uh, I, I think for, for all three of us, uh, it's it's been a an important part of our faith journey and and mission is this work so you know i've i've known her and Essa for years because our congregations have um have been doing work together have been showing up for um for celebrations for uh for interfaith um for interfaith dialogue for interfaith uh um, events and also when uh either of our our communities has um, been in need of support um, and and not necessarily solicited that, but but when we when we've seen that the community is uh, we, we we want others to know that we stand together. Um, so you know certainly that's been from my first days at Washington Hebrew. I arrived here uh, in in June of 2001, um, and my installation was the weekend of uh, September 7th, 2001. Um, and, you know, so much of that first year and beyond, you know, you talk about the Unity Walk, um, which, uh, you know, started after that, obviously, but, uh, but, but so much of, of my work here has been in connection and, uh, and in community with interfaith community on, on all kinds of issues. And, um, and, you know, whether it's being involved, you know, directly with the Adam Center and sharing in lots of moments together or, um, being with each other at moments at the National Cathedral on um, on issues related to gun violence or 
you know, so many different things um, to be able to come together and, and support one another, both within our individual communities, but also on a, a larger um, on a larger level. And I think, um, you know, I for me, this has been uh, it's something I was raised with. My, my grandfather was my rabbi growing up, but was very involved and engaged in the interfaith community. And, um, you know, in fact, the the confirmation program before I was in it, but my dad talks about, and I think my parents are watching, so um, to give them a little credit, but um, but they talked about, they, they would learn about Judaism, but every fourth week they went on a Sunday, they would go to different houses of worship um, to be familiar, not only with, you know, with our own religion, but also to, to understand, learn, and, and build relationships and build bridges. And um, because we need those bridges and we need each other when, when those moments come where we, we don't want to be standing alone, we're stronger together. Um, and, uh, and that's something that uh, I've, I've not just in focusing on Judaism, but also in, um, in graduate school, um, in a, a master's in, in, um, in religion, you know, just being able to understand, again, as I mentioned earlier, just the, the context of, of Judaism in relationship to other religions as well, and, and understanding how we come together, what we can learn from one another, and then also how we can strengthen both our individual communities while also strengthening the, the wider community as well. And those moments are, are some of the most sacred, holy moments are the, are the ones when we share. And I um, I actually was just, uh, her and us and I were at um, the Multi-Faith uh, Neighbors Network a few weeks ago, and I was, we were talking with uh, Imam Majid about, he and I were, um, represented our communities at uh, President Bush's funeral a couple of years ago, and we sat together and just even that, you know, sharing in that moment in a very, in the National Cathedral, in a, uh, a Christian country, um, and having the experience of sharing that and understanding what it means to be a minority, but also understanding what it means to, to be part of the larger community and, and just sharing those experiences, uh, I think are, um, are part of what make me so proud to be an American because I, I, it, is, it is so rare and, and I know it does not happen everywhere all the time, but it is so rare to have that type of, um, of, uh, of respect uh, and um, and to have that type of, of shared community. It's just so important. Yeah, um, completely agree with all of that. Um, I want to take this moment to focus on this idea of people saying being there for one another, right? Giving space to one another. We can say, let's give each other space. Let's give each other the moment. Let's give each other the opportunity to talk about the issues that are affecting us. And sometimes a lot of our issues are the same and sometimes they aren't because we just come from different backgrounds and our experiences are so different. But what does that mean for you as an individual? Say for myself, if I give space to Sabrina, um, who is a black Christian scholar who does a lot of work, but she has a history, right? There's a history of that. Her experience as a black woman comes with her. But when I reach out to her, it doesn't take anything away from me, right? I need to be confident in myself, in my own faith and who I am to know that I could go to her and she could tell me something that she believes in that I completely disagree with and can say, well, as a Muslim, I do not believe in that at all, but I do respect you and I do love you as a sister and that's okay. You can believe whatever, whatever you want. I can believe whatever I want because there are things that I believe that she's just going to be like, no way, right? But that respect is there, that acceptance is there, that understanding is there, that we're not trying to change each other. We're trying to accept each other. And when that happens, that's when you can go out and do the work. But if I'm insecure in myself, my own faith that, oh, she's going to come and try to convert me, or she's going to tell me my religion is less than hers or who I am is less than her, then that's going to be a problem. So we have to be mindful of what we're coming in with. So much so, I will tell you a story about how uh, on one of our episodes that uh, Rabbi Sue was telling us about this, um, <laughs> about this well, okay? And I bring this up because shared stories, right? Shared traditions. And Sabrina and I are both single mothers. And she was talking about in, in the Jewish tradition, how this well- and In the Bible, in the Bible, things happen at the well, people meet. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a Bible, there's a well and there people go there and get and find a spouse and get married. And I joked mm -hmm. around with Sabrina, I said, oh, we should go to the well, you know? <laughs> Maybe we'll find something, we'll bring Uzma along too. <laughs> 
I think it's a new dating app coming up. I think I've seen the well. (laughs) So all of that, if we're not open to who we are and then open to the fact that people are going to come with who they are, our work is never going to go forward. It's all about accepting each other other and accepting and building relationships. Sorry for the uh, Adam's pronouncement. I don't know why they're making so many announcements today. (laughs) This does not happen. Um, But again, this idea of really holding space is coming in within yourself to know that you need to not worry about yourself. It's about the other person. So when I went to Florida a couple of months ago with my kids, we were at, we are in Tampa and this guy turned around and he gave me the death stare for five minutes straight. He was looking at me with such hatred. And my 15 year old daughter looked at me and said, mom, let's go before someone does a hate crime on you. Like she's 15. She shouldn't have to worry about hate crime. And in my mind, I specifically went and I remembered Sabrina as a black woman and the history of what the black community has gone through in this country. My thing was just a stare, right? Nothing happened, but look at what has happened in our history. How are we going to now address this issue? How are we going to bring these issues up and fix the things that are going, going to go forward? You know, I, and one of the things that um, I've uh, been thinking a lot about, you know, how we we have this relationship, but also how um, how this how our conversations also impact the people in, in our communities and in our networks and people who watch and are aware of this. And um, thinking about everything that we do, you know, the the power of of these conversations to impact sometimes the way people are thinking about things or sometimes the way um, people, what people are ready and willing to do. Um, you know, and we, in, in our community over the last year and a half, we've been engaged in really um, uh, taking a deep dive in, into racial equity and looking at um, not just what's happening out in the world, but also taking that internal look as well as at, um, at how we welcome people at um, and what somebody feels walking into the building, what are the things that we're, what things we're not aware of. Um, I want Sabrina to walk into this building and be embraced by our community. Um, and I think, you know, th- those are the kinds of things that we, you know, it, it goes beyond just, and, and those are, um, and that's, that is an essential Jewish value. It's one of our highest mitzvot, one of our highest commandments is to welcome guests and, um, and actually not just welcome them as guests, but embrace them and bring them into the community so that they, they feel part of the family. Um, and I think that that's something that, um, that we try to do and convey in the conversations we have because it's called Sister Act and not just because we're women, but I think that the title didn't make it so, the conversations certainly have, but, but we feel like, like family. And, um, and being able to, to be able to stand up for, as any of us would for our biological family members um, knowing that we'll we'll do the same for our sisters and for their communities. Rabbi, so I think that's an important point because um, that's a reminder uh, for people to understand that you know interfaith work requires that we think about the many identities that people hold and when they come into those spaces. So whether it's their racial identity, whether it's their religious identity, whether it's their gender identity or sexual identity, those are important, but also um, economically how someone shows up in the space um, doing interfaith work that some people might have the financial means to do something a bit more grand where someone else might, you know, do something differently. And so, uh, so in, in interfaith work, it really requires is like this reimagining and that's what this podcast provides an opportunity for people to see is how we're reimagining the ways in which we do our work and how we engage in conversations about our faith um, through our experiences and I really appreciate the fact that you know her and Nessa has all of us we've been very vulnerable but she's she shared her stories um, that you know that uh, could someone could use against her, right? Like, uh, you know, from her community in terms of how she shares her experience, but that's the realness of it. And so there has to be like this vulnerability and trans and trans um, uh, transparency in telling our stories and doing interfaith work. That is if we're intentional and, and meaning um, to make progress. So it requires this to happen. And so, you know, I hope that people that are watching right now think about some of the things that we're saying 
uh, as it pertains to how to do multi-faith work and also thinking about the many different ways in which women approach the conversation. So it, it's really different when women are leading in this, um, this endeavor. So um, I just wanted to touch on that because I thought that was very significant that um, Haranessa and Rabbi Sue raised uh, the differences and, and the significance of identities. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Dent. Um, I have a question for you, ladies, and this is specifically for Dr. Dent, Rabbi Sue, and Hernessa. Um, being women that are leading multi-faith work, we can find ourselves being in challenging situations. It can get heavy at times. Um, if you could answer in a short uh, answer, um, what are fun outlets for you? What are fun things that you do? I think Huri could talk about her singing for sure. Um, and then uh, this is a two-part question. And, and because of time, um, you know, we have about 13 minutes left. Um, I also wanted to ask you guys, so when each of you go, um, if you could please tell us about a woman of faith, living or dead, who has inspired you and why. Uh, personally, for me, it is um, Prophet Muhammad's wife, Khadija, because she was 15 years her husband senior, she was such a rock star. I always say, what a boss. Um, and she continues to inspire people to this day. Um, Khadija would give her earnings. She was very, very wealthy, a successful businesswoman, and she would give her earnings to the poor and to the orphans and to the widows and the sick. And I would consider myself to be blessed and successful if I could follow or emulate in her footsteps. And she reminds me of my grandmother too who was older than my grandfather and also would, would help people that needed the help. So we can begin with um, Dr. Dent. And um, yeah, if you can just share a fun, joyful way that you, you deal with this work. Uh, yes, so the fun, joyful way in which I deal with this work is I love to laugh and have fun. And um, her and us and Rabbi Sue know that I'm very festive. So I was being conservative by sitting where I'm sitting today. But usually I, I decorate my home. I decorate my home for different holidays. And um, that brings me joy and it helps me to stay centered and connected uh, to my son who also loves to see that. But I also love to host virtual Zoom parties. Parties. That is so fun for me to have my friends um, to join. And so that's one of the ways in which I find um, that's because my massage envy uh, person is no longer available. I usually get massages. But, um, but I would say outside of that, the woman that has inspired me, a woman of faith that has inspired me, I actually have so many women that I can think of, but I do want to raise two in this conversation. I'm taking the privilege to do so. One would be Dr. Carolyn Holloway. Um, she was my professor for intro to theology when I was, um, when I was in the certificate program at New York Theological Seminary. And um, I remember sitting in her class and she was talking about um, being made in the image of God. And she had a photo on her desk. And the photo was of, um, it was a black woman. It was a black elderly woman. And one of her colleagues walked into the office and said to her, who is that on your desk? And she said, that's what God looks like to me. And so that was an earlier time for me personally to reimagine what I saw as the image and likeness of God, because I heard it so much in my life that we're made in the image and likeness of God, but the image that was being put onto me did not look anything like me, didn't have necessarily the experiences that I have as a woman. And so I thought it was important to do that. The other person that I want to raise um, in this conversation that has inspired me is um, Annette Kahn. Um, my friend Annette Kahn, who is a member of the Interfaith um, Community of Greater Richmond, uh, we became really good friends um, during, our, during our time together. And I because um, she is, uh, and this is important to know, she's a white woman that converted into Islam in 1975. And, um, and it was important that I, um, that Annette and I built relationship uh, when the shooting happened in, uh, in Charleston, and we had an opportunity to stand in solidarity in Richmond, Virginia, because keeping in mind, Charleston, there were nine people that were killed, murdered at um, the Mother Emanuel AME Church down there. And so we had an event 
And I asked the interfaith community to join me for this event. And it was at a historically black college, Virginia Union, that this uh, memorial service was hosted. And I was asked to speak as an interfaith leader in that area. And when I looked out into the audience, the only person that I saw from my interfaith community that was, that was there was my friend, Annette. And I said in that moment, what does it mean for marginalized communities to stand together in solidarity when they have these moments to occur? And so she has, um, she, she's a wonderful friend and has been very supportive even after my departure from ICGR. So she's someone I want to raise in this conversation that has inspired me to do this work even more. Thank you for sharing. That's so beautiful. We'd love to hear from you, Huranessa and Rabbi Sue. And I'd actually love to hear from Cassandra and Nina as well, who, who's a woman who inspired you. I think Hernessa asked me to go next because I think they're still <laughs> announcing things where she is. Um, and so I'll and I'll try to be quick. Um, you know, there there are a few things I uh, I love to to cook and bake, and um, especially in celebrating, you know, whether it's holidays and sharing and celebrating holidays, uh, not just within my family and Jewish community, but with with friends of other faiths and religions and sharing recipes. And actually, one of my favorite um, uh, podcast that we did for Sister Act was, I think, talking about Thanksgiving and foods that we enjoyed. And we've talked about the feast that we're going to have, you know, once COVID is truly over. Uh, but um, but I feel fortunate that I, I learned that from both of my parents, my mom and my dad, both in, in different ways, both, both cook. Um, and so that was really a, a wonderful model to me as well in terms of that, you know, uh, it's not just a woman's role, uh, but really embracing that. And I, I do that in my own home with my, both with my husband, but also our kids, both my daughters and my son. Um, and also with all the baking that I was doing, especially baking a lot of challah and sharing that with those in need of, of healing and blessing over the last year and a half, I also needed to take care of myself. So um, Peloton riding has become a big outlet for me to take care of myself. And also helps me with all of that stress and and that that energy that sometimes has nowhere else to go instead of internalizing it, being able to let it out into the world. Um, and I'm part of a Pelo clergy group group, which I love because it's not just about the rides that we do together, but also some of what we share um, and the inspiration that we that we share with one another too, which is which is great. Um, it's so hard to come up with one woman. I'm gonna really quickly list um, Devorah, Deborah, who's uh, considered to be one of the judges, the only female judge in the Bible. Um, but she was so important um, and so strong in, in her, uh, in not just her conviction, but even the, um, the, those who led the army did not want to go into battle unless they had her with her. The men would only go if they had um, Deborah by their side. And so it's that kind of strength which we don't often see, certainly in um, traditional and in biblical women, uh, that that she had such the, this uh, the sense of, of conviction and wisdom, and also this this strength that was um, that was lifted up by by everyone. Uh, I also think in um, in the modern era of uh, the first female rabbi who actually was in uh, in Germany um, during World War II, Regina Jonas, who um, unfortunately did not survive. The Holocaust, but um, but it is part of her work. Uh, really served in a community uh, in a in a time of of real upheaval and um, and just to to imagine the strength that it took to be selfless and support others who were frightened and and facing uh, survival and uh, life and death and and to be able to to have that kind of strength. Uh, and then I think, of course, of uh, in the really in the modern age, Sally Presian, who is the first. Rabbi ordained, the first female rabbi ordained um, by the reform movement, but certainly by all the denominations. And uh, uh, just uh, 50 years ago, we're celebrating that this year, the, that there have been 50 years of female rabbis. And, um, and she's somebody I know and have the pleasure and honor of learning from still today. And, and she continues to inspire uh, so many in such a, a humble way and sort of the I, I hope to emulate that as well, just knowing that um, being that sure of what I'm doing, not to have to um, not to have to uh, display it or or it's not about um, being recognized. 
It's about doing the, the work, the sacred work that we do each and every day and humbly serving uh, those uh, in our communities and outside our communities as well. Um, okay, announcements are over. <laughs> uh, we had a funeral, so that's why there was a lot of extra talking. Um, I think when we did the show about the women who inspired us, I did pick um, Khadija, uh, peace be upon her, who was the prophet's wife, like uh, Uzma had mentioned. But I think today I'm going to talk about my mother because uh, I'm the youngest of 10 kids, but my mother passed away when I was five. And I really did not get to know her. She passed away while we were refugees in, in Pakistan. And um, she's buried there in Karachi. She never made it to the US. But one of the stories that I hear a lot from my siblings about my mother was that she was very, very giving. My father was very well off. Our family was very well off in Kabul before the Soviets had invaded. And my mother was a very simple woman. She would cook extra food. And then um, she knew that a lot of the homeless people would come to our house. And we lived in a pretty affluent area and they would come and knock on our door and she always had food ready for them. And I think this idea of service and, and making sure that we're there for those who are less fortunate, not because of anything bad that they did, but that's just their test that God has put them through. But it is also part of our job to take care of those people. And I think I learned that by listening to the stories about my mother that these people need us um, because of their situation, but more so we need them. We need them and our service to them is more about fulfilling our, our own self, our own needs and our own place in society and making sure that we're um, given the ability to serve, right? And they're going to help us uh, become closer to God, right? Not the other way around. We're, we're just giving them something, but what are we getting in return? That is something that's spiritual, that is internal, that we take with us. And I learned that from hearing my mother's story. Um, what do I do for fun? I do a lot of things for fun, but as uh, Ozma mentioned, I am a trained vocalist. I went to a performing arts high school in New York City where I grew up. And um, I didn't think I was ever gonna use the whole singing bit ever <laughs> until Imam Majid, who's the executive Imam here at the Adam Center called me into his office one day and asked me, oh, so I hear you have a music background. And I didn't know how to answer the question because you know, is he gonna reprimand me for that? Or is he gonna say something? Because a lot of Muslim scholars don't approve of mu music not all of them. And then on top of that, there's no service in the mosques that's connected to music. And so I had like reluctantly said yes, because I couldn't lie <laughs> to the email of the masjid. And so he said, okay, and he just banged his hand on the table and said, you're starting our first ever youth choir mosque in the whole country. And I looked at him and said, excuse me, <laughs> I'm going to start what? And he said, yeah, you're going to start the first mosque youth choir in the whole United States. And I will support you. And if anyone says anything, send them to my office. And so that was 2015, March of 2016 was our first day. And we've been having Adam's Beat Choir um, for the past almost five years. Their kids range from seven to 16 years old, girls and boys. They've sat at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. They sang at the Washington Hebrew Congregation so many times. I taught them a Hebrew song of, uh, of peace. They've sang at the National Cathedral. They've sang in front of Nancy Pelosi. They do a lot of advocacy work through music. And through this music, they've actually learned to go into churches and how to behave in there when the service is going on and through Shabbat services. So it's, it's multi-faith, interfaith work for them at a young age through music. And I thought that that was just such a great thing that has happened from that. And so music has been such a dear and intimate place for me to go to when, when I need to let out steam. And so I'll sing uh, on my own. I went to um, Odyssey Israel Synagogue on Saturday. My friend, uh, Micah Hendler, who is the music director of the Jerusalem Youth Choir, asked me to come and teach the congregation a short part of an Afghan song. So that's what I did. And it was fun. So I think, you know, we all can tap into different things that help us kind of get through the day and something to have fun. Um, but also a lot of the things that we have as human beings, as women, we're multi-talented. And how can we use those talents to tap into this work, right? How can we make things interesting? Kids don't like lectures. They don't like to listen to things, but we can make things fun for them, right? So figure out what you're good at. And you, you have a lot of talent, all of, all of you, everyone listening, tap into that, figure out what's good, and then let's move into the work that really needs to get done because we're wasting too much time pointing fingers to each other, but we're not 
fixing issues of homelessness. We're not fixing issues of domestic violence. We're not fixing issues that are affecting our environment. Those are the things that we really need to focus our energy on. Thank you so much. I'll just jump in really quickly. I know we are up on the hour, but just a few more minutes if you could stay with us, everyone. Um, Want to thank our guests again for such great and rich conversation. I see some really great questions here in the chat and wanted to share, we, though we won't get that to them at this in this conversation, the conversation will continue with Sister Act as a podcast. You can tune in. I, I hear that there will be a meeting, a first meeting for the next time. So there's more there. And our shoulder to shoulder staff is always here as well. So if you wanna unpack anything further or have questions that you wanna dive into, all of us are, are making ourselves available to you uh, to continue the conversation in these different capacities. Um, and I'll, I'll also just name a, a woman that inspires me. That is my mother. Uh, she is fierce, she is strong, and she's a faith leader, though she wouldn't describe herself as a faith leader. Um, I come from a Sri Lankan Catholic family. And when my mother immigrated to the US, she started a group of Sri Lankan uh, Catholics to, to get together and pray the rosary, which is a, a prayer that Catholics pray with, with prayer beads um, and, and centers around a Mary, uh, mother of Jesus. Um, and so there's this strong connection with motherhood and uh, mothering in, in our family. Uh, that I, I find um, really powerful and compelling. And I became a mother last year. Um, and it was one of the most uh, spiritual experiences of my, of my life, uh, feeling really connected to my ancestors, as well as the future generations to come. And it was a reminder of this work uh, as, as not just impacting myself and my community here and now, but it's connected to these hopes and dreams of our ancestors, of our mothers, as well as our future generation. And so we're just planting seeds in this moment. And I welcome you all to just call the names of those people that have inspired you because it is all a part of this larger story. And that is such a beautiful uh, and strong motivation for this work. So thank you for this conversation. Cassandra. Wow, I don't think I need to say any more. So, Nina, you've, you've wrapped us up. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, it's been, I would say some of the women that are real inspired to me are the women on this call um, for all very different, for all different reasons, both personal and professional. Um, I, because I am a, a mystic and contemplative, uh, one of my favorite mystics is uh, Teresa of Avila, who was an educator, an institution um, establisher, and a woman of uh, fierce faith and courage to stand up to um, what was then the Inquisition uh, to protect uh, women's leadership as well as education. And so I just have a lot of respect and she just has so much wisdom and care in her writings. And I'm just so grateful to work with all of you. I think all of us work in kind of smaller organizations and it's really the friendships that we form and the, the, the partnerships and the, the ways that we can both work together as well as just celebrate life together, um, whether it's a bar mitzvah or a 40th birthday or um, the birth of new babies. We are, we're all just here uh, for each other. And that's something I really appreciate. Um, and so thank you so much for joining. Osma, do you have someone that you that's inspired you? You posed the question. Oh, you said, you said, I remember now. Could, has, yes, Khadija, um, peace, oh, yes, Prophet Khadija. Muhammad's wife, peace and blessings be upon her. Oh, yes. Well, well I'll talk to you more about that on the side too. She's just amazing. She's amazing. amazing. Um, so thank you all. We will, uh, as Nina said, all of us are available for more questions and um, tune in next week to the Sister Act podcast. Do you want to give a little ending for Anessa, for, for you all's uh, podcast? So actually, I've met both Rabbi Sue and Sabrina in person before. They two have not met each other. So it's going to be their first time seeing each other in person. So we're going to have that uh, live next week, Monday um, at 4 p.m. It's going to be on our Sister Act Facebook uh, page. So please do tune in. Um, and, and we're going to have some really great conversations in person. 
and we're hoping that it'll be something that you guys will enjoy. And if you have any feedback or any topics you want us to cover, please do send us an email or send us a, a message on Facebook as well. Thank you so much to Shoulder to Shoulder uh, for having us. And you guys are amazing women doing amazing, amazing work. And honestly, we can't do any of our work if women are not putting other women up on their shoulders as well. So we wanna thank you so much for bringing us on and highlighting the work that we all are doing together, right? We all are needed in this work. And I'm so grateful that I get to do this work with all five of you. Thank you. This conversation will be up on our Facebook Live as well as our YouTube channels and we will link it out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye guys. Happy Thanksgiving. You too.